is the Pedestrian Podcast. I don't know. That's just what pedestrian average mediocre receivers do. What's up? What's up? My man Deion Sanders, we all right, huh? We all right? Yeah, we all right. We're going to go to the Super Bowl again, being all right. The official podcast of the UK Seahawkers. We are going to follow you. Exactly. You lead us, exactly. okay? Do like it. I told you before, you lead us to darkness, we will follow you. Here are your hosts, Stuart Court. I'm, I'm probably wrong. I am wrong on a hell of a lot of things. And Adam Nathan. And I think if that's the philosophy <laughs> you have going into every game, more often than not, if you score more points, you'll win. Go Hawks. the Woots mentality you know we, we don't care about how many targets we've had throughout the course of the game or what the numbers are we're savages when it's our time to make plays and when we're given the opportunity to make plays we are going to make them and we have shown that you know the the Woots legacy and tradition has been since Sidney Rice was here um, so you know it's not going to change Welcome to another edition of the Pedestrian Podcast, the first Pedestrian Podcast in a post Doug Baldwin Seahawks era. The man who you can hear a couple of times on that intro uh, is going to be somewhat of a focus on this week's episode. To do all that and go through everything uh, in the Seahawks land since we last convened, to join myself, Stuart Court, is a man who spent the last few weeks trying to sanction the fact that he's going to call his firstborn Lucas Mora. Mr. Adam Nathan, how are we, sir? I'm not bad. Uh, I went out last night and my, my wife and I, we threw on a pretty good drunk and uh, the hangover is just about on its way out. So <laughs> that that blissful period has just entered. So we're, we're OK, but uh, still a couple of remnants. But I think hopefully talking through this will, will get me through it a little bit easier. Yeah, so Lucas aids and greasy food. The order of the day, then, yeah? Yeah, I think it, it, sh- it should have been. It, did, well, it didn't go quite that way. Maybe I'd be feeling better if I did. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, 31, I'm still learning. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also, to, to help us uh, give a unique POV on everything Seahawks over the last few months and weeks is uh, the athletics and friend of the podcast, Mike Duga. How are we, sir? What up, guys? What up? What up? Happy to hop on with you, as always. You guys know that. Yeah, how's the off season treating you? Obviously, you spent. We'll get onto one aspect of how you spent it a little bit later. But how's the off season been? A uh, lot. Really busy. Busier than the that, the off season after the 2017 season. Did did way more traveling. Let's see. Went to Phoenix uh, for the owners' meetings. Went to the combine uh, in February. Uh, just those two experiences. I feel like more of an an insider now. I'm not like like chris mortensen yet or anything but like you, <laughs> you know i've once you, you get like a different like feel for being an nfl reporter when you just see like half the coaches just drunk you know at, a, at an event during the owners <laughs> meetings which i definitely did like i couldn't hear sean payton but i'm pretty sure he because he was so animated i'm sure he was talking about that <laughs> mispass interference at the table like two over for me just just drinking hand just you could tell it was almost like and then I talked to the office, and then they told me they missed the play. And then I'm like, you could just see it on his face. Like, doing those type of things this offseason made me feel way more uh, inside of me. It's great. And, uh, and and you met Kiara, which I got an excited text about as well. Oh, that was – yeah, that was also in Phoenix. Phoenix was great. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, that was also – it was like we shook hands. I said my name. She told me hers, which I love that famous people are committed to doing, uh, <laughs> as if we don't know – uh who they are because i get it like you don't want to seem arrogant you just say hey my name is hey my name is jay-z but it's just like come on jay (laughs) like i didn't get here not knowing who you were but (laughs) i and i have the whole moment uh i was recording russell so i kind of have the whole moment uh saved i need to like get it printed out or the words printed out or something like that or save the audio somewhere where i'll never lose it because i'm treasuring it forever (laughs) so you think Stephen a smith introduced himself as Stephen a or steven when he meets people like that I was just wow, that's weird. I was just wondering how people decide whether to use their middle initial. Um, like I don't There's know. There's no how, way he doesn't say he's Stephen he, A. Smith. He, he's that he kind of guy. Thousand percent is. 
I mean, you you have to. He, his name is almost like you want to do the full thing. Like I think Michael B. Jordan is probably in that same space mm-hmm. where he doesn't go by Michael. It's like, hey, I'm Michael B. Jordan. Like, which is weird because if I use my all initials, I'd be like, hi, my name is Michael Sean C. F. Dugar. How are you? And they'd be like, <laughs> they'd be like, what? I, I need to I need to know the thought process on how people decide. Hey, I'm going to use my middle initial now. This is how you address me. Yeah. Uh, also, but also with, with the introduced him it does that viral clip links Oprah and, he, and she introduces Beyonce and she thanks her for saying her name it's really strange but anyway uh, yeah so uh, obviously the main news that came out a couple of weeks ago from the VMAC was the somewhat surprising with how sudden and just kind of filtered the way onto a weird statement that uh, Doug Baldwin and the Cannes Chancellor were released and so it, oh, it's almost certain that they retired from the NFL um I don't want your initial reaction. So we kind of knew it was coming with, especially Cam, with the year of the making dog. We kind of expect it at some point over the summer. But what's your reaction to seeing it all, all official? It was one of those moments where you kind of look at the phone, look at the tweet coming in, and you're not really sad because you've kind of done your sporting grieving already because you know it's on the way. But you just wince and think, yeah, that's a bit shit. Uh, I found it a bit strange that they released the statement, like a singular statement about both players, because yeah. both of them, for me, kind of deserve their own, I don't know, moment. And it seemed a little bit ham-fisted to do them both together, um, especially as Cam has kind of been retired for two years for the sake of argument. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of obviously just just doing the right thing by, by the cap, I presume. Um, so that felt a little bit strange to see it happen for both of them at the same time. But... Um, I would imagine that both of them are, are much happier in the, in the long term doing what they're doing, knowing that, you know, that they, they don't have to, as Jason Jenks say, they don't have to fight for anything any, any longer, which I imagine is quite a relieving place to be. But, you know, it, it's a real shit one because, I mean, certainly for me, Doug Baldwin will be probably my favourite ever Seahawk for as long as I live, I think. Yeah, he's, I think I think I put in the thing that actually made me get some use out of my degree. I put an article up on uh, 99 Yards. First time I've wrote anything for about 18 months, and that's kind of what he, he's one of my favourite. Even if I wasn't a Seahawks fan, I think he'd be one of my favourite sports people, sportsmen to watch, just for the whole how he is on the field, how he is off the field as well. And as I said on Twitter and Facebook, go check out the Geekwire podcast thing he did uh, 18 months ago. Or so it's just brilliant. You see things from an athlete you don't usually see, and hear things from an athlete you don't really hear. How, Mike, what was your reaction to the news? I think when it became official, because uh, like, like you guys mentioned, I already knew for a while that uh, he was leaning and leaning and leaning. And once it gets reported that you're leaning, it's basically like, how can I figure out the best way to do this without going broke? Uh, for, especially for the the ve- uh, veteran guys who got a lot of years. Uh, but when it got, became official, it was, it was weird how just not sudden. But I think, like, for example, my tweet after I got the news was just um, – it was simple. It was like Doug Baldwin has been released or something like that. And it was just like, wow, man, that's it. Just like that. No more Doug, you know, and it's just what, like eight years or yeah, like eight years of just, just awesomeness is just done in a tweet. That's it. You know, that it was very, very weird to like come to terms with. It was just so simple. I mean, obviously they put out, everyone wrote stories and there was like a, a tribute video from the team later. And, um, uh, I think I can't remember who from 710 is doing the like uh, 89 Doug Baldwin moments, you know, every day. I think it's Lydia. But, you know, that first day, it's just like, yep, Doug's off the team. That's it. It's like, wow, that's it wasn't. Yeah. Like Adam said, it wasn't sad. It was just I'm like, wow, I guess that's it. I, I guess we're done here. But did that carry over to the OTAs last last week or so as well? Is that kind of feeling still lingering that Doug isn't out there? You know, that didn't – it didn't, actually, until Chris, my po- uh, podcast co-host, Chris Kidd, he was there uh, up at OTAs, and he just kind of blurted it out. He was like, man, it's weird without Doug. Uh, and that was actually the first time, because we were watching the receiver drills, that I actually thought about it, because I had already processed it in my head. You know, I think at that point I had written, like, three articles about what the receiver group looks like without Doug, so I was already – like prepared for it in that way but yeah it wasn't until chris mentioned it i think that was like last monday was or tuesday where i was just like man you're right damn doug's gone this is sad as hell 
did, did did you see any change? Obviously, you're obviously there most days, most weeks during the season. Did you see any difference with him? Because obviously, he had to step up a little bit more with everyone who left last off season. Obviously, Earl Thomas wasn't around for most of the season. Did you see him step up in different ways, or was he just Doug Baldwin that was Doug Baldwin pre all the dramas of that off season? I mean, you could tell. Like, I wasn't here for people who don't know. I wasn't here for you know the 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 glory days for lack of a better term i came in in the 2017 uh, in april i think so like my first my first day on the job i think or my first like assignment big assignment was the draft when they took uh malik mcdowell so i wasn't there for like a lot of angry doug um but i i was there i i got like introspective doug a lot and it was very like weird very like Zen Yoda y type of feel, which a reference I can use now that I've seen all the Star Wars. <laughs> uh, like this, it it was, you know, he didn't like speak in like code like Tyler Lockett does, but it's definitely like you can tell it's coming from a place of like wisdom. It's almost like a soldier coming back from like battle, where it's just like, yeah, man, I am really tired, you know. And then you you like mount that with like him losing his friends every year that i was there like i was there for three months and then they traded jermaine curse right then you know four months later they cut richard right and then they trade mike b and then they you know cliff's out cam's out the, then earl holds out and you're just you can tell if you're doug you're just like damn you know p rich walked you know it's like what what is going on you know like where are all my friends and you could just kind of see that uh, from Doug, uh, and also, I mean, I kind of knew that Jason Jenks piece on Doug was coming at some point, but uh, even even without that knowledge, I didn't learn that till like December, I think. Doug was just, you could tell he just like old like old guys do, like whether you're like 60 about to retire, you just don't give a damn anymore. You know, your boss tells you to be there at eight, and you're like, you know what, it's eight fifteen, maybe I'll show up. You know, Doug, Doug was kind of like that Sam swearing in press conferences on, you know, on camera, which you, they advise those guys not to do um, saying, you know, prefacing his comments at a press conference with they're going to not like that. I say this, but which is basically like, screw you. But, uh, you know, he, he did things like that where you could tell, you know, he talked about how the season was hell. It definitely seemed like a guy who was tired and probably on his way out. It's when it had its fail of it. At the end, especially that the clip we put on the start of the podcast after the Kansas game, you could kind of see it was kind of he was some, he was a bit more restrained than he probably wanted to be, but you could kind of his, the tone of his voice was kind of yeah he kind of had his feeling, especially after that Kansas game where he had his well, it was Kansas where he had his probably most impactful on the stat line last year, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, that's where he had, I, I don't know if that was his biggest game, like yardage wise, but I know he had some big catches, yeah, yeah. uh, in that, in that game. And it was just, it was that game. And I think either the chargers or one of those Rams games where he was just like, man, it's almost like after the games, he was like, just happy he could still do it. Yeah. You know, cause there was mm-hmm. so many other elements factored in as the, in, there's the injuries too. Like on top of the stuff, emotionally with the friends and stuff like that. There's the injuries, too. It's just like, man, I got a bad knee, and I got this bad groin, and I got this bad shoulder. And, you know, he's a guy who has high expectations for himself. And, you know, he much of his life has been predicated on proving himself on the football field, like competing at the highest level with the guy across from him, with the guys next to him, with whoever, you know. So, I mean, I don't know this for a fact. I've never talked to him about it. But I imagine that, you know, Tyler having all that success was like bittersweet in a way. Like, you know, Doug's, Doug was coming off like three straight thousand yard seasons. Right. And now there's the, it's the new young hotness, you know, stepping in, getting all love, catching all the touchdowns, you know, having all the the big plays. So, I mean, I don't know how big of if a big a factor that was, if at all. But I would imagine like knowing Doug's psyche, the way he's allowed us to uh, to enter it, that probably weighed in, too. Like, man, I'm I was the guy. Now. Now there's a new guy, you know, who they just paid and who's younger and faster and probably better you know that that probably factored in too yeah speaking of his psyche let's say he has a year i mean he's he's not old he's what 30 31 he is so 30 he's not, i believe okay so yeah he's not you know retiring due to age let's say he has a year on the sidelines and you know he gets himself right how how likely do you reckon he is is he as a person to maybe you know have bill belichick pick the phone up and say you know do you fancy doing a year in new england uh what do you think come to camp 
what are the chances that he might do that? Because he strikes him as a guy that kind of exists with unfinished business. And if he got himself right physically, I, I wonder if he mentally could could be ready for it for another crack for for one year maybe. That that's interesting because like the I was assuming you guys read Jenks's piece with Doug, uh, yeah, uh, which is just just beautiful. That piece was so long in the making as you can as you can tell, and it really. I'm, I'm, it's hard to predict those guys who are like defined by football, because um, as Doug clearly was, and not just like he needs something to do, you know, every day, like somewhere to be. Like some of those guys, like need the structure of that that football brings, because any job can give you structure, right? But he needed the validation that it, that it brought, and then kind of realized that that was whoa, super unhealthy. Uh, so I don't. I think once you realize that and once you step away from that and maybe try something else, uh, it's not even about health. It's almost about, like, can I find validation in something else? And maybe if that doesn't work, then it's like, okay, let's try this football thing uh, again. But because Doug kind of recognized how, like, I want to say damaging it was, I guess bittersweet's the best term because, like, Doug's more famous than he probably ever would have been if he didn't choose football. Uh, But because he's recognized how, like, dangerous football was for him mentally and physically it'd be real tough for me to see him put another helmet uh back on and kind of risk going back into that cycle it but it's, it's it's somewhat like a bit like marshall the only team he was going to put the cleats back on for was oakland because that city that town that area that community def- somewhat defines him more than the than the, the game that he played that doesn't there doesn't seem to be that kind of place for Doug Baldwin to go back into for that reason does there? No, nah, it's unless like you know if Rich, him and Richard you know Richard's involved somehow or like yeah. you know Jermaine Jermaine's involved somehow but hell I think Jermaine's still on time we don't know what's going to happen uh, with him he might be t- next to to step away yeah I think it would have to have some type of like emotional connection there I don't think he has went to a team or a city. Uh, I definitely think it would be loyal to like his his uh, his family or our close friends, and I don't think I think once he got to that place, I, I, it would be real tough to imagine something drawing him back out. Because I mean, football was bad for Doug. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it was great. It's weird to say because he's you know going to be like a Seahawks legend, get his name in the the Ring of Honor, or whatever. It's you know, but like it was bad for him. In a, in a way, which is 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 really weird to say because like it didn't kill him or anything. He can still walk, um, and also that's another part that Bobby Wagner mentioned. Doug was kind of able to leave on his own terms, um, in a in a way. Although he was like technically released, as opposed to like Cam or Cliff didn't get that option. And I think if Doug was to try and play football again, he'd be playing with fire, and it would like the chance of him being able to walk walk out on his own terms would be like. Next to none. Mm-hmm. So, but off off the field with Doug Bowen, if he if it if it is a permanent uh, end of his career, uh, this that that's that aspect of him is just getting started, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is the if I was Doug, I don't know what I would tell him to do. If I if I was close to him, I would honestly tell him to just to to walk away from from everything for a little bit because the dangers of like being that like fiery and that competitive and that like uh and that like passionate about being great it can like eat you up no matter what you choose right i've seen people reference that hey maybe you should hop in in politics or something like that i mean that can consume you too and and mess mess you up and be bittersweet too like it's not like politics is some carefree stress-free world that's not hyper competitive um which is like good for some people but if if you determine that like those worlds can consume you and you start to like – you're not necessarily doing it for the wrong reasons, but like uh, find your self-worth in something that – you know, in, in others, then, you know, that's that's dangerous. So I, I would advise like, hey, man, start your family. You know, go go ask Phil Jackson what log cabin in Montana he hangs out in <laughs> or, you know, what, what ranch Kanye made his last album in in Wyoming. Like get away or get away. And then surround yourself with people you love and trust, because um, he kind of reminds me also of like a struggling musician or a comedian or something like that who I like to put on a face to satisfy like the strangers and admirers. It's like, nah, man, just go somewhere where you can just be Doug, mm. you know. And the people there love Doug because he's Doug. Uh, you know, be around as many of those people as you can. That's what I would 
advice for him. Yeah, uh, but uh, Adam Offfield, as a fan, is what set him apart somewhat, wasn't it? Yeah, I just everything about him was just great. Like he, he was as, as real a person as there was. Uh, right down to like the you can tell Chris Carter he can Google that moment. It was just, just there's nothing worse when well for me that when players try and pretend that they like are ignoring the outside noise. Like I'm not sure if you remember if, uh, two two years ago when Luke Wilson was uh, saying like that they all heard the the line that the Philadelphia game was uh, and they used that as motivation. Like I love that and I, it's great when players don't pretend that they're like not robots and. His just one man crusade against all of his doubters, as you say, like Mike, it links to the the idea that you're just you know so consumed by it that you looking for any any like chip on your shoulder that you can use as an extra percent motivation. I just love that about him, and um, I, I can't imagine you're going to see many guys like that again uh, on this team be such a leader. Just he was just the perfect guy at the perfect time in the, in the perfect team for him. I think. Here they come, pass across the middle, and it's caught for the first. It's Baldwin, shaking free and sprinting down the sideline for the touchdown, his third of the day, Doug Baldwin. When we were kids on the field of the first day of school, It's good, it's, uh, you know, it's nice to be back feeling myself running again. I think uh, just over a period of time, I mean, obviously playing this game since I was six years old, I don't know what it's like to not have football in my life. So uh, to be out this long, um, <laughs> I don't want to – it was hard. It was hard emotionally. So just glad to be back out there. But boys will be boys and girls have those eyes that will cut you Pressure put on, and a one-handed grab by Doug Baldwin. Sensational catch. That was awesome. Watch this catch. On third down and ten, you don't know if you're going to get drilled in the back. You don't know what's going to happen. He comes down and keeps that drive alive. Pete Carroll wants to convert some third downs. Superstars have to make plays in the playoffs. There's your guy. You're my nana, she has a Big target. Here's Baldwin, smaller target, and he ducks in for the touchdown. Wilson to the corner, and it is a touchdown. Doug Baldwin. It's hard to tell you this. What's up? What's up, my man Deion Sanders? We all right, huh? We all right? Yeah, we all right. Here's looking at you, kid. Uh, but obviously the, the other guy with that uh, end of an era thing was Cam. Uh, Mike, is the defense going to change more without him or Earl? Because obviously they double dipped on the safeties in the draft. I, I think the the most important thing is like the attitude that these guys are bringing. It's funny, I'm actually writing about Marquise Blair. Uh, right now, like as we speak, I have the document open, and it's just it's really an attitude about all those guys that it's hard to really replace. Like you can find skill sets, you can find equal combine numbers and shuttle drill numbers and whatever, but Mike, Marshawn, um, I mean even Russell to an extent, Richard, Earl, Cliff, like they came with like an attitude about them especially the legion of boom they came with the attitude like look not only are we really good we're going to let you know we're really good while we're being really good against you and that's not really like seattle you know like that's not how this city this is not like a a sports city with a rich history right like we have a baseball team that hasn't made the has the longest postseason drought in major sports right like with this is i'm not gonna say it's like a city of losers but we're not like boston it has a rich history of producing champions and Hall of Famers and greatness, right? Like, we don't have that swagger. We're the, like, South, we're like the jokingly named South Alaska portion of the country. 
that's like often forgot about. Like people are seeing that now with like the Portland Trail Trailblazers being nobodies until like May when Damian goes off in the in the playoffs, right? So see what those guys did: Cam, Earl, Sherm, Mike, Marshawn, is Bobby too. They came here and they brought a kick-ass attitude along with their play that kind of like set them apart. It wasn't enough. It wasn't just that like they were wanted to beat the Denver Broncos. They wanted to beat who people believe was like the best offense of all time to show that they were truly the best of all time. You know, they had that hunger in them and they were confident. Like we're the best defense ever. So we're going to kick Peyton Manning's ass. And the next year we're going to kick Tom Brady's ass to prove that you can't beat us. And we're the best defense ever. Like, I don't, I don't know if you can find a bunch of guys, you know, in a row and a bunch of drafts all built like that again. Like they can want to be great and all that's fine. But those guys were built. They were all wired so differently. Like, even if Marquise Blair can knock people out like him, and even if Bradley McDougal can cover like girl, which he can't, but, you know, even if if LJ Collier can rush the passer like Michael Bennett, and, you know, even if Shaquille Griffin can cover like like Sherman, they have that attitude. Like, Doug wanted to kill people. Uh, Richard wanted to kill whoever was across, you know, the field from him. And, if, and he would let him know, hey, man, I'm going to try and kill you. You suck. You have hands like a snake. And I'm better than you. You know, that's that <laughs> couple that with all all pro talent and you got like the the best defense ever. Right? I don't I don't know if they'll ever find that again. And that's not the slight the guys are going to try and bring in. But like that's just speaks to how special those dudes were. Uh, it, it kind of it kind of is kicking the, the, the that that group. They come away with one Super Bowl. I don't. Yeah, but the weirdest thing is that. You know, I'm sure, Mike, you, well, you, you obviously see it all the time because you work in this area that it's amazing how many Seahawk fans have, have been so quick to dismiss yeah. the personalities of these players that they love them for their personalities, but then when they leave and show the same personality, uh, they then decide to turn against them. I've seen so many, and I have, I have to say that it's always the same demographic of fan uh, that decides to choose this. And I'll, 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 I'll say nothing further than that. But... <laughs> Um, it's amazing how quickly like a hero becomes a punk to uh, Seahawk fans uh, when given as you're, you're right, they completely change their mindset. It, it, I almost feel like they're underappreciated versus what they would be if they were kind of from a more traditionally winning sports town. Oh yeah, absolutely. Stick, stick the Legion of Boom in Baltimore or stick the Legion of Boom in, in New England, stick the Legion of Boom. I mean, hell, even in Cleveland. Stick the stick the Legion of Boom in Cleveland, right? Or stick them in a uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to pick another. Oh, Dallas, yeah. Stick mm-hmm. the Legion of Boom in Dallas, and it would be no question. The movie would already be out. Legion of Boom movie would be <laughs> dropping this summer. If, if if they played in or Philly, you know, like that, it would be unbelievable. Like they were already like popular. Like all those guys are very popular, and they reach superstar status. At least Sherman did, which is hard to do in a game where you play with your face covered. They're like, yeah, you you can't overstate. The, the attitude that they brought. And yeah, I mean, Adam, of course, fan, fan, like fans relationships with players is, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's like transactional. It's like, yeah. you're doing this thing for me and my city and my team that I love. So I like you. As soon as you stop doing that thing for my city um, and my team, I stop liking you. And you get a little bit less of that in a town like, Seattle just because we really fall in love with people because again we're not we don't have a rich history of winners we have like good people who have been like good Huskies good Cougars good Mariners good you know Sonics and good Seahawks but like there's not just new ones flooding in you know every other draft so when we get them we love them and there are for all the people who are like oh I hate Richard Sherman now and he called rest mediocre or whatever and the 49ers there's people who are like nah man I remember the tip and I don't care if Richard Sherman coaches the damn 49ers. <laughs> yeah. I will love him <laughs> till the day I die. And I yeah. think that's that that part is unique to Seattle, I think, and like small markets like Seattle because of the, the, the lack of like a really, really rich championship history here. So there are people who are like, yeah, man, I don't care where Marshawn goes. I don't care what Doug Baldwin does in their life. I will always be rooting for them. It's it seems like that's the minority because that that. That there's really a loud minority of people uh, on the internet who are like in the opposite spectrum, but I think they are appreciated in that way by people here. Like I love Richard Sherman, Marshawn, Mike B. I love those guys forever. There, there are fans I think like that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think Mike Bennett going to the Patriots has, has made me w- want to watch more Patriots game this year than I probably did before because he's just so much fun to watch. I think, and also with Doug Baldwin and Cam, as soon as that was announced, it was people touting up David Moore immediately, Adam. Yeah, it's like, it, it's not even like let the body go cold. It's no. just that the, the the idea that oh well like Griff uh, you know Sherman's gone but we've got Shaq Griffin and uh, it's okay to lose Doug Baldwin because he wasn't that good last year anyway and we've got David Moore it's just it, it's just so ungrateful more than anything else yeah, yeah it's it's but it, that's the nature of football though like um, I like to remind people that they have a death chart for a reason they don't just have a roster they have a death chart <laughs> like in case of emergency we are already paying this guy if we can't have you like, I mean, mm. that's, that's what the depth chart is. Yeah. You know, it's a too deep for a reason. Like we are too deep because we can't afford to just only invest in you. So yeah, yeah. That's like the way rosters are structured. is like a built in contingency plan. And that just, because that's just so normalized, we're just so prepared. Like uh, it's, and though I don't think fantasy football is as much to blame as people like to say it is now, but I mean, that plays into it too. What happens when your guy, tears his ACL, you know, on Sunday, on Tuesday or Monday, you hit the waiver wire, <laughs> you know, you go, you move on, you know, it's, and it's a uh, fantasy football. People have, don't have the same attachment, but yeah, you see it happening in real time uh, when, you know, Oh yeah, we lost the, uh, lost Marshawn. It's cool. We have Thomas Rawls. It's like, <laughs> mm, no, 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 that's not, that's not good enough. It's like, Oh, we lost Richard Sherman. We have, we have, we have Shaquille Griffin. It's like, no, Nope, nope. Richard was an all pro. I don't think people also understand how all pro works. Like that means you're really the best. <clears throat> you know, anybody can make the Pro Bowl. You know, Justin Britt made the Pro Bowl, right? Or it was like an alternate one year. You know, and that's not like the slight Justin, but it's like no one considers him like a Pro Bowl center, right? But he has that on his resume. You know, you can make. You know, the but KJ was an alternate playing three games. <laughs> like anybody can <laughs> can make the Pro Bowl. When you are all pro, that's like you are elite. That's why when when, uh, when Richard Sherman made all pro, he went on there and told Skip Bayless he sucked. <laughs> you know, it's like, nah, man, I am all pro now. I'm all pro, Stanford degree. I'm way better than you. And he actually wasn't lying. No, no, it was a pretty low hanging fruit at that point. Um, with, with Cam, obviously, he, he's, his career is effectively over a year ago, pretty much to the day they announced that he's been released. What what role did he play last year around the building, around the sidelines, Mike, for the team when he was around? And will that continue now that he's off the team, technically? I I doubt it continues. Uh, and I don't necessarily think he was in there, like, running meetings or anything. I think he was there, like, to, to, for guidance. Um, mm. And even, like, you know, on the sidelines, little things. But I'm not necessarily sure it was, like, a coach on the field or coach on the sideline type deal there i think he was around which was for a lot of those guys really just all they needed like yeah. cam's in the building it's not like hey i'm gonna go i mean i'm sure he was helpful texting whatever i'm sure he'd just sit there and watch him struggle and just be great without any acknowledgement but i don't necessarily think it was you know like a, they had like another coach there it's like no they had they had cam in the building and then that was that was enough for a lot of those guys because Cam, Cam just was such a, a leader, not necessarily by when he spoke, which he took on that role later. But it was mostly just because, like, you knew when he put on that visor and came out of the tunnels, like, cool, he's going to kill somebody today <laughs> and I'm going to help. And now that was that was like his superpower. You know, his voice was like a secondary power. His superpower was killing. So when you take that away. I'm not going to say he doesn't have any value. The value is lessened dramatically, at least for me. I didn't talk to a bunch of guys in the DB room who like seemed like super impacted by him. Maybe I just didn't ask enough, but I don't necessarily think it was like an invaluable experience for uh, those guys. I think it was the same like when, when Earl was there. Uh, it was more just like, hey, you know, Earl's here. And we get to watch Earl. So that's the real benefit as opposed to like every day after practice, Earl talks to me about such and such and such and such, if that makes sense. Yeah. But like, but like the Seahawks and the Legion of Boom, they, people say it kind of changed how teams look at cornerbacks. But Cam Chancellor himself kind of changed how the game's officiated somewhat. And then with all the, obviously the Vernon Davis hits, uh, there's that when he 
plays out and Arn Anderson's spine buster on the, the guy in Cleveland, he, t- did he change how the game's officiated with just that brute physicality? I think it's more the – well, I think a little bit, and I think mostly the NFL reacts to, like, guys who get hurt a certain way. <laughs> More than it can cram hurt guys, but not you didn't see a lot of guys like getting carted off immediately. He didn't have no. that rep, which is actually pretty impressive because it's easy to get that <laughs> rep. Like I think Deshaun Goldson got it really quick. Uh, I want to say Bob Sanders didn't really get it, but I remember him knocking people it's, out too. It's, it's Swearinger as well, and Washington safety as well. Yeah, yeah, like it's real. E- you know, Vontez Burfick, like it's real easy to get labeled as a nasty player. You know, and Cam was able to somehow be like a, a killer without like necessarily having that be like a negative. Uh, I really think it's just like you mentioned the size of the guys that they had and the technique that they were using. You see a lot of people playing a lot of man, a lot of pressing, getting big corners, you know, to combat these you know these big receivers, you know, with with certain arm length and all that. Like uh, we had a guy, our guy at the Athletic uh, who covers the Colts, Stephen Holder. Got like a behind the scenes with uh, their GM, Chris Ballard. And he like takes a bunch of the reporters into the like draft room after the draft and like break down the prospects, what they liked about them. And then twice in that setting, just in Chris's, or excuse me, in Steven's story, he mentions the Seahawks, right? At multiple positions, like both at DB and, you know, on the defensive line. Like you can tell teams are trying to be like what the Seahawks have created here trying to be like pete carroll because it's a copycat copycat yeah. league so i think just the you know finding those big corners byron maxwell you know sherman browner uh, browner's another guy who built different mentally i mean that might have backfired <laughs> on him later but he built differently and i think teams right now are trying to find like the skill set and probably what they're discovering is that dang we don't, we're not finding the guys who are built like them mentally. But, yeah, they, yeah. I think they changed. And I think the year they won the Super Bowl, they led the league in, like, pass interference penalties or something like that. Mm. So, And I think the Patriots led it the next year. Uh, so, like, the, the physicality and their style, I think, is, is being copycatted, and I think it's going to continue to be mimicked for years and years. And is, isn't one of Ballard's white men, someone he was – with Schneider in Seattle, the guy who bought Grayson. Yes. Is the, yes. the guy who found Grayson, wasn't it? Is it Ed something? Hobbs? Ed, is my Ed Dodd? That, that's it. Yeah, yep, I think yep, he's pretty yep. high up in, in the... That, that Stephen Holder thing and all the stuff from Ballard from the draft is so, so good. If people haven't give, checked it out, especially all the the video, the Colts were out as well. It's really, really good. Uh, Adam? So... We're, uh, we briefly brought this up earlier before we, uh, we started on air, and I think, think it's time to, to get into it a little bit closer. So you're talking about all these old players that are Seahawk heroes, and they have a tendency of getting together fairly regularly, whether it be uh, retirement parties or weddings or maybe the odd birthday. And even Pete Carroll was there at a Cliff Aver retirement party. And there's one guy that is never there, never. Um, and at this guy's own wedding, none of those guys were there. Uh, and I, I sent Mike a text a couple of weeks ago saying, have you noticed that Russell Wilson just isn't at any of these parties? Uh, and I normally expect like a dismissive text, but I kind of got a thing back saying, that, oh, you, you noticed that as well. <laughs> so what's the deal there? Because the guy doesn't seem to have any mates. And that just doesn't, it doesn't seem that should be right for the guy that's supposed to be the leader of the whole bloody team. And basically, not that, you know, people have gone because of the quarterback, but it, if it wasn't Wilson's team beforehand, it certainly is now. Like, he is obviously the numbers one, two, and three guy in that locker room now. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, Ed Dodds is the assistant general manager in Indy now. So, yeah, that, that would explain why they've, you know, picked up a bunch of former uh, Seahawks. You know, Glowinski, they picked up Pierre Desir. Cyril Grayson for a little bit. Anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is – the wedding thing was the first thing that jumped out to me because I don't think I was covering the team at the time, but I remember hearing about it. I think that, like, Jimmy Graham was the only teammate in the wedding party. Maybe Robert Turbin, too. Turbin. His Turbin. Name, Turbin being his best mate was kind of the first alarm bell for me. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I mean, I was like, that's a little weird, uh, but you try not to read too much into those type of things, but then – you look at all the other weddings that happened. Like KJ got married a couple of years ago, um, you know, and you look at who was all there. I think Cam just somebody just got married that reunited Legion of Boom. And I think it was Cam. 
uh, uh, two years ago, uh, last around this time, actually. Uh, reunited all those guys. Sherm just got married last March. You look at all the people who were out like in Hawaii or wherever that was. There, I mean, it's like, like Deshaun Shed got married and they were all there as well. Yeah, like <laughs> you, you can see like which guys linked up like really fast. I mean, I just saw on Instagram Kevin Pierre Lewis just got married, right? Like Mike Morgan was there. Uh, KJ's <laughs> there. Um, you know, you just you connect the and it's not all just like who was that at my wedding, right? Because it's you know the schedules. You guys are all famous. But I mean, even like Jason Jenks, again, uh, our guy wrote a story about, uh, I think, the relationship with like some of those guys. And you can see like which ones hang out, like Cliff and his wife and Jermaine and, and, and KJ's wife and Richard and Doug and his wife. They all like did like a paint and sip recently or they'll all like work out or, you know, just play Uno, whatever. Right. Normal things you do with your friends. And, yeah, I, I personally do think it's kind of odd that the, the quarterbacks – you know, not there. Yeah, retirement parties. You know, you, you'll see guys throw camps at their old, you know, their old hometowns. And you'll see who will show up to those, you know, and things like that. Those are a little tougher because those are hard to schedule. But yeah, celebrity basketball games. Like you'll see Bobby Wagner show up to. I think he just did uh, Kristen Michaels. I think a few uh, months ago. I it, I do think that is weird, and it, it's one of those. It's those little things that when you see them enough, it like validates or adds validity to stuff like the Seth Wickersham article from a couple of years ago, probably two years ago, close to today, to be honest. Uh, if the one, I mean, you guys remember that when Seth just yeah. basically wrote like, Hey, Richard Sherman hates Russell. And a lot of the guys on the defense resent him too. And he gets preferential treatment. Uh, he's kind of a phony dude who like sells transparency, but yet makes people sign non-disclosure agreements when they come sit in his suite in the Mariners games. You know, it was just, Little things like that, you know, he buying people buying gifts with endorsements like, hey, here's some here's Alaska tickets for all my linemen. It's like, dude, you're Atlanta, you're Alaska Airlines brand ambassador. <laughs> you know, did you even buy these? You know, I mean, it's it's little, right? It's those are none of those things matter for scoring touchdowns, running touchdowns, whatever. None of that matters. But if you want to talk about like, how do people feel about so and so? It's it's you got to connect all the dots. It's not just the putting the you know that's my quarterback under you know his instagram captions it's it, sometimes it's like hey man my kid's having a, a third birthday man you baby futures such and such you should bring them or you know i don't know if that happens but those things do like uh they're illustrative of how close people are on the team and i think it is noteworthy that like the leader quote unquote of the team is like notably absent from all the like seahawk reunion -y stuff that's yeah. been happening lately I mean, I mean that the Cliff Ava one was weird because I mean Russell Wilson was playing video games with someone on Twitter at the same time. <laughs> oh, that was kind man. of like, was that the same day? It was, yeah, well, it was, it, the next morning was when we saw about Cliff Ava, and then like twenty hours earlier, he got Cliff, <laughs> he got Russell Wilson playing Mario Kart or whatever it was, Smash Brothers. Yeah. Or something. Oh wow, I didn't even wow. That's yeah, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, at the same time, though, that make that kind of makes how it, Russell Wilson conducts himself with everything if that is good i'm not saying it is but if it, it it kind of makes it all more impressive how he conducts himself and how he plays and how he leads his team with whatever else happens when the cameras are turned off i mean he also does make it clear like he's not really speaking to this necessarily when he says it but he says look i'm i, I care about winning yeah. You know, and he really does like dude doesn't like party and drink or smoke. He's just like, well, I guess they can't smoke. But we've learned from all these retired athletes that, yeah, no, dudes are smoking. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he doesn't do any of that. So, you know, now he, now before he was the family man. Now he's family man. So now he's got all the reason to not, you know, uh, show up to stuff. But I mean, he I don't know if he gets invited to things either. I don't know if he's the, I want to make that clear, I guess. I don't know if he's like declining invites or not in the group messages. I honestly haven't dug that deep into it. I see a lot of the same stuff everyone else sees. I see Instagram posts of weddings and there's no QB. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, well, I haven't really, I don't usually talk about it that much unless asked about it or it comes up in some article is that it's, it's, it's pretty inconsequential to, to the product on the field. All of those guys, whether they go to baby showers, bar mitzvahs, bat, you know, baptize things or you get your kid baptized or whatever, you know, baptism, that's the word. Uh, whether you go to that stuff, they'll all believe, you know, in in Russell on Sundays. They all do. Like, firmly, like, 
uh, I think Russell just tweeted a video uh, compilation with of Doug Bal- him and Doug Baldwin, and or maybe it's just him, but I think the video starts with Doug in the Minnesota playoff game where Doug's like, "We will we will follow you, lead us, and we will follow." All right, and then you you contrast that with the guy who left Russell out of his letter. It's just that's perfect. Those are two perfect examples. Doug recapped his whole life <laughs> and left <laughs> and left Russell out, which is whatever. <laughs> but like. He, on the field, he believed in Russell as much as anyone in the building, and I, it, yeah. that's weird. But like, the, believing in him is more than anyone in the building. That is what really matters on the field at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, look, not, none of it actually matters. No. It certainly doesn't matter that old players don't really <laughs> like him because you know they're not playing this Sunday. But it is the off season. We've got to fill time with, with nonsense. So the, the other thing that I, I again, this doesn't matter, but has been very striking is and i don't really know how to phrase this properly without kind of sounding politically incorrect but like the wilson has definitely developed a second voice one way or another <laughs> this off season I, I, I don't and bomani jones was that was the first one to to comment now maybe yeah. he's had maybe he's had the second voice since he got into the league and what we think is the second voice is actually the first voice that he's always had but that's also just weird now and you know what? It's not even – it is a weird discussion topic. But, again, like you mentioned, it's the off season. At the same time, off season or not, that is just odd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if nothing else, it is just weird. And, yeah, Bomani pointed it out. Honestly, it came to my attention, I think, a couple years ago. Uh, I think I retweeted the video again recently that C- uh, Russell made a video in his closet with Sierra wearing his old high school jersey. And he is using a voice and a tone – that I've never heard, and <laughs> he's used it again since. It's the same one from the uh, the Hey from Seattle, the we got a deal. The, yeah, yeah, it's the same one. I recognize it, which is just now that I recognize when what occasions he uses that voice for. I'm super uncomfortable recognizing it the way I do. <laughs> but like, he, it's like there's that voice, and then like I don't know how often you guys, anyone listening, tuned into it when he had the Trace Me app. Uh, there was definitely some code switch, not even code switching, just voice changing there. Where, like, if he's leading his Russell Wilson QB camp, it'd be like, this is this voice. You know, hey, guys, blah, 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 win, you know, mental toughness, whatever, go Hawks on three. Versus, like, the very next video could be him, you know, in the locker room with Tyler after practice. And it's just, like, a different accent, different just (laughs) infliction. Or it's just like, wait, hold on. This This is very, this is very strange. And it's noticeable. And I think the Hey Seattle like amplified it you know because obviously what he was announcing in the video but it's been it's been weird for a little bit and now i can't even i don't even know which one's the real one and which one's <laughs> not you know this this got uh discussed a little bit in a rolling stone article i think from 2015 um i think if you just type in russell wilson rolling stone just in that in google it'll first thing it'll pop up uh, where I think his agent says something like, I've never seen anyone be able to just like adapt to his surroundings in this way. And he compares Russell to a politician. And I imagine that was meant to be a compliment. But like now it just seems kind of like weird. And again, it goes back to stuff that Seth mentioned in his article from ESPN and that Robert Klemko hinted at uh, well in the SI article from last August, I want to say, as just like... Um, it's, a, it's almost like lacking authenticity a little bit where it's just like, OK, who who are you? You know, is it because there's a difference between moving in different circles, especially as like a black athlete or entertainer? Like I like to reference Jay-Z. Right. I, if Jay-Z is with, you know, his homies from you know New York that he was selling drugs with at one point or making rap records and strip clubs with, he's Jay-Z one way. And then if he goes to a meeting with Sony or whatever, I'm pretty sure he's a little different. But I don't think anyone would necessarily be like all right one of those is like fake jay one of those is real jay they're all just different mm-hmm. versions of jay but they're all still like venn diagram a version of jay whereas i think where what, what seth gets at in his article and i think what Clemco kind of gets at in his and it's kind of hinted at in the rolling stone one is as well although that one's a little older it's just like it, on one hand you have guys selling transparency but it doesn't seem like it's it's built on like genuine authenticity and it's just a weird weird mix of of like advertising there it's very yeah. very very weird 
it's it's like that uh, Key and Peele sketch, isn't it? It's become a meme with where he's shaking hands with all the politicians and he he changes his handshake when he comes across certain politicians and yeah, that's what kind of what we're see, stuff to. like that is is normal though. Like for for me, because like yeah. so like if I'm on a football field and you know I walk around, uh, this happened in Pullman when I was covering Wazoo a lot. Um, you know, I'd see like it'd be some of the white players, like you know, we'd do the you know business, the handshake, and then I'd see you know black dude. In my age, listen to the same music. Where everybody, oh, what up, man? Dap up, shake the full hand, fingers touch, and we lean in shoulder to shoulder. You know, and dude, I don't even know. Right, that that stuff is normal, but just like the the fact that the the different voices just be like catch people so off guard. Like I think Tyler Lockett and DJ, those guys made fun of the video because they're probably in their group chat as teammates. Like, dog, did you see this? Who is who is that guy? I'd have been dying. Oh, where did he get the chains? Where's this voice come from? Like that, I'm pretty sure they were all taken back just like us. Like who, who the hell is this guy in this video? The thing is, he had all the not black enough stuff a couple of years ago, you know, and I, 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 and I could care less, you know, what you know, he he needs to be comfortable with in his own skin, and that that's all that matters to me. And you know, whatever color, creed, race you are, you know, everyone's the same for me. But it, it's almost like it finally has come home to roost with that. I mean, I personally, and I'm just guessing, I personally think that the Wilson business voice is what he actually is and this one's a bit of a caricature some people might think it's the other way around fine but i don't know it just kind of feels like it's he, he's just read stuff and wants to change it but it's it's almost become like a comic book character after that yeah and, and i think what um we've been kind of getting better at it's just easier to find receipts quote unquote in like the social mm-hmm. media age where it's just like if you're one way right now we can well it'll take me two seconds to pull up whether you said something contradicting that five years ago or there's this video where you sound completely different or we're dressing different or we're acting different around this group of people or or whatever it's so easy to find that stuff now that like even if you want to do like a rebrand or you want to change it's just so hard because we have so much of this evidence that you aren't that so you know even if even if you want to be like hey i'm I'm this guy now. Like, look, look at me here doing this thing with these, with these people, and I sound like this, and I dress like this, and look like this. Like, nah, man. There's a whole Pinterest account of your bad wardrobes in 2013, man. So, nope, we, we, we remember all of you. That's what, what it's gonna be. So, I think, I mean, that's probably a little bit unfair because people grow, people change, but like, and and as it pertains to Russell, it is weird. Is operating in this space where. A, Again, referencing those those articles again, it's like the the cell is transparency. Like, hey, look, I'm, I I do this app where it shows you how I eat and what I, we and my family are doing. And look, I'm playing video games with a guy I met on Twitter. Like, this is me. But then it's just some people don't appear to be, at least in the especially in the Seth article, just don't appear to be buying it. You know, this is what's just being sold. This is what's being bought. Uh, and they don't always match, and I think that's probably the best way of putting it. Again, it doesn't matter, but it when you're you know, talking about a superstar, best player on the team, whatever Hall of Famer, it is just an interesting look at like who he is as a dude in total. So uh, early off season, you did that piece on him, a uh, minor league Russell Wilson. Is, when, when you were doing, when you're conducting all the stuff, interviews, and having conversations around that did you did you find that you're hearing stories that you can vouch for seeing yourself first time in the vmac kind of like, oh yeah he, he, he still does that he still uses that phrase kind of thing is that something that kept cropping up when you were doing that from russell wilson back when what was it 2011 uh yeah when was that that was the summer of uh summer 2010 i think yeah. is when he did that i don't i mean he wasn't saying like go dust doubles after every press conference <laughs> but uh, i'm sorry i did ask uh, uh, the former beat writer uh, for the team I asked if he, if he did that um, he, he said no he never did that I asked the, the radio guy too it's like hey did you ever do this uh, it's I mean it's, it, it honestly sounded like a lot of it was very similar to what the Russell we got right now the guy who's like wake up wake up super early get there early stay late hyper focused on winning wasn't really like if the guys would go out to the bar after a win which minor leaguers do a lot uh, or after a loss too uh, Russell didn't really go. Uh, watched what he ate pretty well. Uh, although it was funny to hear his house, his host lady said that they ate McDonald's because he will not eat fast food now. Hell no. Uh, 
<laughs> which a lot of players are kind of getting there now where they're like, I'm not going to put this junk in my body. Like, even if they're offering me a multi-million dollar deal, screw you, Coca-Cola. Michael Bennett's like that as well. Uh, uh, but aside from that, like well, one trip to McDonald's or whatever, some of those things are very, very, very similar too. where guys again. But those guys also like, man, he was really cool. Uh, he was really dedicated to winning. He was really good at this, not so good at that. Um, he wasn't the leader of that team necessarily because it yeah, wasn't that good. But uh, at, the stuff that I learned from talking to people was that it was very consistent with like the work habits, the eating habits, the the social uh, life. Cause especially at this age, all we all we do to kick it mostly is go out and get drunk, right? And if you don't <laughs> drink, you're just naturally just not gonna, you know, just to hang out with a guys are just going to go out and get get hammered and be smoking, whatever. Uh, which, again, not weird. Nothing wrong with that. But as I, I found actually things to be really consistent with what we see now from that 2010 uh, Dust Devils team. Uh, uh, yeah. So, obviously, another part of the offseason has been the work that John Snyder is doing. I mean, he it, it's not wild to say that he's had as strong an offseason as he's had for quite a few years, Adam. 100%. I mean, every deal has been, I would say, pretty smart. We, we discussed the, the Frank Clark permutations, what we'd be happy with. And I know, Mike, you said in, you know, a couple of times that there's just no way these guys are going to give him, you know, 17, 18, 20 million dollars a year. And they really maxed out on what they could get for him. I think they did a great job with that. Um, I still kind of feel like we have about 33 players on the roster, <laughs> uh, which, which needs to be fleshed out <laughs> but at, at, at some point. But um I've always thought that this year might be a bit of a step back versus last year in the sense that there just has to be a rebuild year happening at some point. And even if this is to be it, I still think they feel fairly well set up to at least be competitive this season. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think the, well, the Frank thing, it sucks for Frank. Well, no, nah, he's still got the hundred mil, but uh, I think they did plan on paying him. I think that was the plan. And then Demarcus Lawrence now, now, it's not just that he reset the the mar- or set a market floor. It was that you know that was that's top defensive end in the league money. Essentially, yeah. I think Frank is like the highest paid defensive end now. I believe because I know Khalil Mack's technically an outside linebacker or whatever, and so is Von Miller. Uh, so maybe it's someone else, but like I think Frank is like that now. He got paid as if he is one of the best defensive ends in the league. Now, can you argue that Frank is? Probably. I could. If I want. I probably have in an article or two. Um, did, does Seattle feel that way? Well, clearly not. Right? And at the end of the day, if you look at it that way, just simplified it as like, does Seattle think Frank's one of the best defensive ends in the league? If the answer is yes, then they should have paid him like that. If the answer is no, then you don't. You know, but I mentioned how, how different all pro is from the Pro Bowl. Frank hasn't made it either, right? Like that, you know, spe- speaks to just like not not only how tough that position is, but just like the difference in like what's, what's elite at pass rush and what's really really good. And I think the deal he got from Kansas City is like really really good. Or no, the deal he got from Kansas City says you're elite, you're the best. But Seattle was like you're really really good, you know. So if you don't think he's elite and he's the best, yeah, you flip that into however many players you can. I, I think someone at field goals or some maybe SB Nation or something did like a breakdown of all the players that they've turned the Frank trade into. And it was like 10 dudes uh, or something like that between like having the room to sign Ziggy and having the room to bring in like Al Woods or all that type of stuff. So I think for, from like an offseason perspective, did the team get better? You know, you lose Frank, you lose Doug. Um it's hard to say, but I do think if you if you factor in, here's the tough part about May and June and July. You know, you you have to factor in growth on the part of some of the younger players on the team. You have to account for like regression for maybe some guy uh, older guys on the team. You know, so, but it's hard to figure out who and how much. Like, at what point does Dwayne Brown stop being like awesome, right? And then at what point does you know? Trey Flowers take off. At what mm-hmm. point does you know J- Justin Britt's not old, so maybe he's not a great example. But you know, okay, here's a good one. What if uh, at what point does like KJ slow down, right? And then okay, but what about Rasheem Green? Where is his jump? You know, you have to balance all that out when you're estimating, 
and it's really hard to do. I think it's probably a wash at this point. It probably just – if you factor all that in, they probably have enough talent to win 10 games again, right? Like you, you have if, – if you account for like – Maybe Tyler doesn't have the you know the best most efficient receiving season ever, but hey maybe you know DJ Fluker's better. Maybe Jermaine Effetti's better in year two under Solari, right? Maybe Rashad Penny is you know a lot a lot better. Puna Ford plays more, but maybe you know Bradley McDougal takes a step back in coverage or whatever. You, you balance it all out based on projections and whatever, and I would say they probably will break even. Also, you know account for Russell getting better. You know, he, he somehow finds a way to every year, like, no joke. So I would mm-hmm. I, probably look at another 10-win team. Can't win the Super Bowl until you can beat the Rams. So I, I I can't say that until they find a way to to figure out Sean McVay because they have not. So until then, you know, you can't can't talk Super Bowl. But, I mean, it's definitely still a playoff roster. Mm-hmm. What's your gut feeling on the Wagner situation? Because I feel like I've been in this situation the last two summers – saying about guys like Sherman and Thomas, like if you're not going to sign them or if you're not going to trade them, then, then trade them because the last thing you want to do is let another top player walk out the door with nothing. And the Frank Clark deal for me was one that I said to Stu before the before it happened, what would Bill Belichick do in this situation? I think he would 100% you know, take what he, what he the production he got from a third rounder, turn it into a first rounder and then rebuild. And they, they did that and that was great to see. With Wagner, if I, I, I'm kind of torn, knowing what to do given the the money that he could probably rightly demand. Um, in the same way as with Frank Clark, like can the team legislate to spend that on a guy that's that's pushing it in age? What, what's your gut feeling on what they will and what they maybe should do in your view? I think they should pay him, mm-hmm. right? And I think that it's not in the same space as like Earl or uh, or Sherman. And that, like, the the relationship with, with Sherman was damaged, right? That was just clearly mm-hmm. just insubordination. Like, he got to the point where he told the <laughs> offensive coach, hey, man, stop doing that. And he was like, what, man? You play defense? Like, I don't care. Don't do that again. We lost the Super Bowl because of that, you know, and then doubled, the doubled down. And you know what? I respect that because, again, I, everything that happened is really validated that Wickersham article, man. It's like, Sherman's not letting that go. And you know what? Nor should he. That must have mm-hmm. hurt losing that Super Bowl like that uh but so I, bobby's not like that right you know you know bobby didn't walk in the locker room of another team with his current team jersey on and say hey man sign me uh you know he didn't tell the coach what plays to run so bobby has been <laughs> the upstanding citizen or whatever you need to be to be in the teams like good graces or whatever there's that part there's the the fact that you know bobby's not stupid Right, like so, he's gonna he's been preparing to represent himself for a while. He didn't just wake up and decide this. He's been studying contracts and paying attention, and doing this for a long time. I know Richard Sherman said he spent like forty eight hours or something like that looking over contracts. I think I think he probably worded that poorly. I think he's actually spent a little bit more time uh, than that. But I know Bobby has. So I think that the negotiations were, are gonna get ugly uh, mm-hmm. because. You know, Bobby made it clear in his press conference, and I've, I've this is my understanding as well. It's like uh, Bobby believes he's way better than C.J. Mosley. <laughs> you know, so way better. And it's not even a debate. Like, it was a debate whether Frank's better than Tank Lawrence in Dallas. There is no debate um, as to whether Bobby is better than C.J. Mosley. But Seattle might argue – and that's a bad contract they gave CJ as well. Yeah. Like we shouldn't just try. Well, Adam, Adam Gase, years. Adam Gase said as much last week. It was a bad contract about his own team player. Right. Yeah. It's like that. I mean, if if Adam Gase, if it, we're going to the Jets a little bit, but for real, like if he got in there and overthrew the guy that, that ended up getting out of there because he didn't like the Le'Veon deals and the CJ Mosley deals, those are actually reasons to get a dude can. Man, those are two bad deals. And so the Seahawks are probably going to counter with something like, hey, man, we don't just want to just try to just beat a bad deal. So let's structure this a certain way so it's not bad. You know, and I'm sure um, I got to give a shout out to uh, I can't remember his name. I think it's Evan. Uh, dude over at I think Hawk Blogger did okay. a really good projection on Bobby's contract. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it is really good. Uh, I think it gets it gets the average per year somewhere around 17 mil. Um, gives them a 
a little it gives him more money i think guarantee like a higher percentage of his guaranteed right at the signing than cj mosley it also uh has uh, a good uh, dang i can't remember the what was so good about oh like it follows all the seahawks structures right because they don't like to guarantee salaries past the mm-hmm. i think the first year of the of the extension and this this actually the way he structured it does not invest at a later date just like the seahawks like to do so I mean, the, the contract's gonna look something like Russell's and something like Cam's and something like Bradley McDougal's and Justin Britt's. Those all have, you know, and Tyler Lockett, Dwayne Brown. They're all very similar in that they have a certain portion dedicated to uh, guaranteed money right away, and then some of it vests later, like the fifth day of the league season, like after the Super Bowl or whatever. Uh, I think it, you're, you're gonna see a deal like that where it's something like seventeen, seventeen five or something like that a year uh, with a uh, a whole hell of a lot guaranteed right away, and then another big chunk that guarantees, you know, at the in 2020 or whatever in February. Like I think they 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 should and they will keep Bobby because mm-hmm. unlike Frank, uh, he is all an all pro guy. Like all pro really means this is just you and someone else who are good at your position in the league. That's really it. Yeah. Like, I, I think that's if, if for people who don't know, look at it that way. Like if you're all pro, that means I'm good at this, and one other guy is as good as me. Essentially, that's it. That that stop there. So if you're Bobby, like yeah, it's me and Luke Keekley and everyone else, mm-hmm. right? That's why Earl was like, man, it's me and everyone else. <laughs> and I <laughs> couldn't couldn't blame him. To be honest, he probably should have paid Earl too. Earl's gonna ball out. Hope you guys are here for that game. Uh, but yeah, I think they should pay Bobby. Because, yeah, he is that elite. You're not just going to find another Bobby Wagner. It's it's a yeah. little bit arrogant, but probably, like, good business to think you can find another Frank Clark because you realistically probably can. You will not find another Bobby Wagner. Like, that's that's pretty much guaranteed. Just turning briefly to OTAs, um, we, we joked about, well, no mates apart from made one friend, and it's a quite a smart guy to pick as a friend because he's probably the biggest human being that's ever existed in DK Metcalf. Um he seems to be getting rave reviews from the the OTAs and the drills he's been running and looks markedly better than the other guys they drafted. How how much has he surprised and jumped off the page since uh, since starting practice? He definitely jumps off the – just, I mean, that dude is big. Man, he's like – my my go-to comparison has been like he weighs as much as Cam, same height as Dwayne Brown, and faster than Tyler Lockett. Like put all that in one dude, no lie. That's not he ran. Uh, he ran a faster forty than Tyler, so I don't know if he's like faster than Tyler right this second. But just if you put their forty times together, he, DK ran faster. So put all that together, and that's DK Metcalf, right? Like, does that mean he'll catch a bunch of passes this year? Because I mean, he was just that big in college and was like a uh, really good. He wasn't like an elite college receiver. Like the guy, the other guy playing opposite him was probably better, yeah. right? But you know, I think. For me, if I had expectations for DK Metcalf, I would look at it more like this in his first couple of years. Even if he's not like this elite, you know, route technician like Doug was, I don't even think that really matters. If he can become elite at just doing one thing, one or two things really well, then that's fine. When you have already have Tyler and you have Russell and you got to run first team anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think if like if they drafted, you know, a bigger Deshaun Jackson. Or a bigger Mike Wallace. It's, if that's effectively what they just grabbed, that's really good. Because then he's also six <laughs> four. You know, like think of how good Deshaun Jackson is, right? And what is Deshaun Jackson good at? Running straight. Yeah. What is Ty- what is Tyreek Hill good at? Running straight. <laughs> you know, what is uh what is Mike? What was Mike Wallace really good at? Or that dude who just got busy against the Seahawks in 2015? Then Marcus Wheaton, I think Martavis Bryant, <laughs> one of those dudes. They were just gonna go on straight really fast and you just had no chance of catching them if if and they were elite at it if 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 dk is that as a rookie or, so, or second year guy that's fine and honestly <clears throat> that's what david moore was really good at <laughs> last <laughs> last year you know to be honest he's running like three four routes so if if, if dk is that but the six four faster version then yeah that was, that's good that's really really good yeah that's that's what i, I think that's what i said on the podcast when i don't know 
he's he's really good the one thing Russell Wilson is better than anyone else is and that's go and get that deep ball down the red line which is what he did more often than not for Ole Miss compared to what uh, AJ Brown did uh, also also with the rookies um Whenever you you said that you were writing a piece on Marquis Blair, uh, his his uh, answers aren't going to help you hit, hit word counts, are they? Oh man, no, <laughs> that not at all. Like it's just beyond. Like rookies are pretty like hit and miss. Some of them talk, some of them don't. Like Puna doesn't say anything. Uh, neither does Jaron Reed. You know, Marquise is in that same vein. Uh, whereas like Ugo Amadi is really really colorful, you know. Uh, I'm trying to think of recent years who's been. But Will Disley was really good. Uh, obviously Shaq was really good, but Trey Flowers doesn't really say a ton. I'm used to that. It's whatever. Marquise is just like, yes sir, no sir. How you doing? Good. Uh, how was practice today? Great. How you feel about Seahawks drafting you? Great. Changed my life. It's real brief. And I've been talking to people like I think I. Uh, just a little preview there and talk to his high school coach, like several of his JC coaches, old teammates, because I'm also doing a Cody Barton story. So I talked to some guys at Utah. Uh, just everyone's just like, yeah, man, Keith doesn't say much. Not that, and not even that, it's just like he doesn't have anything to say or that he's like mad or disrespecting you. It's just more like you ask him, you know, I think, for example, he, his, his uh, phone call with his recruiting coordinator for at the Dodge City JC that he went to. He was like, it was like a two minute conversation. He was just like, hey man, we want you to play here. And he's like, coach, I'm looking for somewhere to play football. Boom, done. End of convo. You don't need anything else other than the itinerary for getting the kid to, to practice from wherever he's from. Uh, so I, I actually have found it to be very intriguing because I think it is going to be really cool when he does open up to someone. I don't know if it's going to be me, Bob, Greg, or whoever. Uh, but I mean, it. it Digging in the dude's background for the last like week or two that I have post Game of Thrones, uh, I've definitely learned like that dude's consistent. He didn't say nothing in high school, he didn't say nothing in college, and he ain't about to start saying nothing now. Uh, you know, not to us, not to the coaches, probably his homies and his <laughs> family, but definitely not to us. And you know what? I told Steve, I added there, I was like, man, it don't really matter. If the no. kid can play, he'll make the team and he'll be just fine. He don't got to say a word. Yeah. Um, I- and how how quickly after rookie minicamp didn't sound like they did anything of uh, positive note was uh, Gino Smith phone number rang with after the rookie quarterbacks came into camp that weekend because it seemed to be pretty swift to bring in another experienced body instead of going with the inexperienced rookie. Oh man, the rookies they bought in were not good. That was that was very very clear. And people who know me have talked to me about players on or off the record. I'm very careful at least off, on the record. And when I say guys aren't good at something, uh, those guys were not good. And I have no problem saying it. They were just, they were just not. And it, it reflected. None of them made the team. Uh, they, they brought in new guys. It was like, nah, man, they not good. Like when Pete Carroll said Alex Magoo stunk, it was just like, you know what? That's 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 bad. Uh, you know, but until until the Seahawks, if you don't, they want to start copying people, uh, they need to copy the Patriots, copy the Saints, like invest in your backup quarterback spot. Keep drafting quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Even if you have Russell Wilson, you can t- if you got two fourth round picks, use one of them on whoever led the league and led the nation in passing that year. If even if you just took that kid every year in like the maybe it'd be harder to do in the day three, but try and get that kid whoever that is every year. You know yeah. whatever, just try because even if you don't need a starter, you know you have insurance for your backup, and if he turns out to be really good, you have a trade piece. I think the mm. Patriots turned Garoppolo into a second and Jacoby Brissett into, what, a first? Yeah. Or, and like, I, th- I think they've got two seconds from Matt Castle. Yeah, it's just like, that's... Do that. <laughs> Try and do that. Even yeah. if you pay Russell, you can still... They had, a, what, 11 draft picks or something like that? Yeah. Uh, one of those definitely should have been a QB. Like, even... Don't be afraid to take one in the second or third or something like that. Really don't, because... It, it takes one play for that dude to be the most important dude on the roster, and it's not it, it's not a, because your your quarterback's injury prone. It's just one play, right? That's it. it. Just takes one. Cliff's whole career ended in one play, right? Like he was mm-hmm. perfectly fine. Boom, gets kicked in the chin by Jacoby Brissett, and he is done forever. Right? That's all it takes. You know, even this. I mentioned the Saints, not necessarily because they drafted. Um, What's the what's the guy's name? Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill. And he's he's already he's already been worth the draft pick. 
If he uh, retired tomorrow, yeah. he was worth a draft pick. He's been good in the game plan. He's been fun to watch, and he, they've used him. Well, someone tweeted that they got the Saints have Taysom Hill running all the black guy plays, and I can't just – that's <laughs> all I can think about now. Just, <laughs> they, they really do. <laughs> they, they do. They have that running, running all the gadget <laughs> stuff that you would think that they would use for like – the Vikings had a really bad backup quarterback that they did all that. I think it was Joe Webb that it looks, looks very familiar – but yeah, Taysom Hill. Or they traded for Teddy Bridgewater, right? Mm. With with a Drew Brees still kicking ass, they uh, they decided, you know what? Let's get some insurance because we're trying to win the Super Bowl. And maybe we won't win it with Geno, but we'd feel a lot better with Geno, or excuse me, with Teddy Bridgewater than we would with Taysom Hill or whoever else. And that's that's what you got to do sometimes. No, they didn't need Teddy. Drew was just fine. But they could have needed him, and that would have changed everything. I think the Rams took a similar approach. I think they signed, what, Blake Bortles? Yeah. Uh, but, who, but, he stinks, but, but it's the same principle. Like, you can win games with, with Blake if everything else is going well, and the Rams have everything else going well. But also, they do have Jared Goff, so it's not as, as sheer a drop-off, is it, though, really? <laughs> Bortles could be an upgrade. <laughs> Bortles is so bad. <laughs> oh, he is. He is. So I, someone needs to ask Jalen Ramsey what he thinks of Blake Bortles now that he's not <laughs> on his team because he's had no problem going in on every quarterback and then yeah. kind of you know put the put the training wheels on when talking about Blake. You know, yeah, he just skipped the regular season. He was like, yeah, no, nah, Blake's Blake's good in the playoffs. That's what they need, Blake. It's like, nah, man. There's 16 games in the season. If he sucks for 16 of them, and he's good for two, that means he's not good. That's, that, you know what you have there, Eli Manning. Like that's, <laughs> you know what? And you said he sucks. So yeah. that someone someone needs to get Jalen on record because it's going to be just awesome. Because yeah, yeah, all those guys stink. Also, Jalen's now got your coup down there. Now, I think mean, uh, Minshew was a draft pick for the Jags. Even after they oh. went and spent all that money on Foles. Oh yeah, that's that's right. And then they they got rid of uh, I think did they get rid of someone? They got rid of someone who was in their quarterback, Cody Kessler. I think they might have had down there uh, from this. USC. Yeah. I think they got rid of him. I think like right now it's like uh, Nick Foles, Gardner. They have Alex Magoo, I believe. But oh yeah, I'm confident. If Jalen says he sucks. Me and Jalen are going to argue. That's going to be my first ever Twitter beat. <laughs> if if Jalen Ramsey comes out and says Gardner Minshew sucks, I'm hopping. I mean, it's going to be me and like a whole Coug army, but I'm going to be very loud. I imagine me and Jessamine are just going to just go in on it. Uh, and if she's not willing to, I will definitely just hop in and just start. I will start the beef. Well, I mean, he will have started it, but I will continue. I will just like fan fire to flames or whatever the phrase is. I will. Yeah. I will get it going. If Jalen does that, that um, that is a promise. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Stu and I are going to be like that. If Xavier Rhodes comes out and slakes Jake Browning in Minnesota, I think we'll be like, <laughs> yeah, you're probably oh, right. Yeah. But uh, but, yeah, but there's, there's, there's there's not many looks more made for South Florida than Minshew's mustache and his jorts, though, are there? Oh no, man, I love Gardner so much. <laughs> I, uh, I I really do. <laughs> what, what, oh. Speaking of your guy, uh, your guy Browning, I'm gonna throw some shade at him real quick because it's the coup in me. My ho- my homie over there, SB Nation, uh, who's really good analyzing NFL and college. I, he's a big Falcons fan. His, his Twitter is four verts. Yeah. He's really, mm-hmm. really, really good. Charles McDonald. He was uh, they drafted you know Trey Ad- or who was it? The, yeah, Trey Adams, I think. No, uh, Caleb. Uh, McGarry, excuse yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Yeah, McGarry. they drafted McGarry, and he went to go look at film. Because he's a Falcons fan, I think for one of the first things he tweeted is like, "Yeah, man, I'm watching Caleb McGarry film, and I keep wondering, is what the hell is Jake Browning doing on every play?" <laughs> yeah, I love and, that, and I loved it because Charles has no connection to that area, so he was genuinely <laughs> just like, "Man, what is number three doing every play?" Like, I'm very confused, and I was just like, "Yes, man, that's oh, it's Charles's birthday today too, man." I oh, I gotta text him. That's was that was say, beautiful. It's his birthday, so I saw oh, it on Twitter, and and also I mean, I mean, speaking the, of the, number threes on a slightly more poignant note, it would oh, have yeah. been uh, Tyler Hidinski's birthday to, today, so we'll we'll wish him a happy birthday as well yeah. wherever he is. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. Yep, I did beautiful. see that. Uh, but also, uh, quick, you talked about stuff you may not want to talk about, but uh, at the end of January, Adam sent me a text saying that you were going to the Super Bowl, which sounded pretty cool, but it turned out that. You your life was going to be written by Donald Glover for a week, Mike. Uh, how was it being an honor for that week? Oh, that was a that was a beautiful week for me, <laughs> and, and not just because I like frequented several strip clubs. It was mostly it was mostly the fact that like Seattle was like I, I, 
three percent black or something like that, maybe six or seven. I, I think if you like count the like surrounding uh, areas here. So you know, down there it's like the mecca right now. So you know, as soon as I stepped off the plane, you know, all the you know flight attendants are black. Everyone in the everyone selling food at the airport was black. You know, all the Uber drivers and you know were black. All the you know I went to go get a rental car. They was black. The like hotels, the liquor store, the gas station, you know, Waffle House, everyone, you know, bouncers, cops, whatever, went to the mall. That was just a different experience where I was not in the minority. Like if I walked to South mm-hmm. Center Mall, which is in Tukwila uh, here, uh, suburb of Seattle, I am very much in the in a minority space. You know, we've so Seattle's pretty diverse. You know, we got a little bit of everything, but it's. I am definitely in a minority there, whereas everyone uh, in in there, I went to like the the mall down there. I can't think of what the name of the really popular one is that I went to in Atlanta. And it was just like everyone, you know, same same type of style of clothes, hair. Uh, obviously, the, the voices were different, but we were all speaking the, the, a version of the same dialect. It was just beautiful. It was definitely felt like like home. You know, in in a way that I I wasn't really prepared for. That was great. I mean, I text my editor Steve. I was like, hey man, can I cover the Falcons? Uh, <laughs> and he was he was like, nah man, we need you. I said, can I demand a trade? And he was like, nah, it'll end, it'll end up like Earl. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm staying. But that part, like, in, aside from like, like I said, I, I was I spent a lot of time in strip clubs there, like a lot, a, a lot, a lot. But that part was not. I mean, that part too. Like the, the girls were all black. Right? Like I go to strip club here in Seattle. Uh, I mean, no, no disrespect to the to the, 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 the skinny little white girls they have in there, but that's just not my flavor, <laughs> right? So, I, to go down there, in Atlanta, that was just beautiful to see the women, the men. Everyone just looked like me. They talked like me. I walked in a room, and they just kind of understood where I was coming from before I said a word. And that's just really important. You know, I went to a really expensive jewelry store. I tried on a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar Cartier watch. Um, I asked a dude to try it on. He didn't look at me funny. You know, he was like, sure. Mm-hmm. He's like, probably assumed I was in a rapper or a drug dealer or something. He, whatever it is, he was comfortable uh, assuming that I had the bread for that watch. I do not have the bread for that watch. <laughs> and I put the watch back. But he did not, you know, he didn't look at me funny. He didn't need to call security. You know, it was just like, uh, yeah, man, try on this $250,000 watch, Mr. Whatever Your Name Is. Pretty sure you can afford it. <laughs> right. Whereas if I do that up here in Bellevue, I go to the Nima Marcus and I go down there with, you know, Louis, Louis Prada, Gucci, whatever. You know, me and my friends walk in there, you know, wearing our you know jeans, chains, hoodies, whatever. I'm like, uh oh, all right, let's get our eyes all on these guys. Right. But that didn't happen down there. So just being comfortable in that space was the best part of Super Bowl weekend. The game sucked, you know, <laughs> but it's like <laughs> being down there was was that was the best part. Like I said, it really was like a home type feel. I'm Jewish, so going to Israel feels exactly the same way, and it's it's a, a feeling that you can't describe. When all of a sudden you you go from being an extreme minority to being around ninety percent your own people, it, it, it's indescribable. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Right? It's it's, it's mm-hmm. yeah. It's that was the best the best part of. I'm going back. I, I, I'm so happy to go back for um, when they play the Falcons. Like I can't wait. I'm gonna try to squeeze an extra day out of that. Uh, trip or something, man. I got, I got, I have to. It was just so beautiful. I'm now I'm, everywhere I go on my list now, like traveling. I've been telling my friends, like, I don't want to go back to Vegas. You know, I, I want to go somewhere where people look like me. I want to go to Atlanta. Let's go to New Orleans. Let's go to Texas. Let's go to D.C. You know, like I need that feeling again because I got back home and quickly reminded that it ain't like that home <laughs> <laughs> back home, not even a little bit. So what? What before we there was another question, but what does a quarter of a million watch look and have to make it that much? That's wild amount of money. Oh yeah, I did just kind of slip that in there. Uh, <laughs> that was, I mean, I didn't know how much the watch cost. I, this is how broke I am. He said it was two fifty, and I'm just oh man, I'm about to buy this. <laughs> and then I had to I had to go in the I was in the back room with him trying it on. I just had to play it off like. Once I realized the price, I was like, first I had to realize how to let him know, how to get that confirmed without sounding broke. And that was that was really hard. I contemplated that. Uh, I think what I did was I sat down when he put it on the table. I sat down. I was like, oh, man, that's what 250000 gets you, huh? And he was like, yep. I was like, cool. Confirmation. Bang. 
got that. Uh, tread it on. It was yeah, always heavy... always play the over. Never play the under in that situation. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that was that was stressful. I felt uh, I was like, oh, I've cornered here. Tried it on. It was just it was flooded with diamonds. The the whole band was diamonds. The face was just diamonds everywhere. Just like iced. Just oh, it was just all diamonds everywhere. Flooded. Like if you hear rappers say flooded, 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 it was flooded with with diamonds and it was heavy it was the heaviest thing i've ever had on my wrist it was probably i don't know how much it weighed but it felt like having a shoe on my wrist <laughs> like it was it was unbelievably heavy and icy and beautiful and yeah i had no i think then i had my next move was figuring out how do i tell this guy that i don't want to buy the watch with also again not sounding broke this is all very hard to do in real time without being awkward i think i told him that i really want the watch but my if I, if I buy it right now my wife will have me sleeping on the couch for a month or something like that and then he was like yeah man i understand he probably knew i was lying but i felt better about that version of the lie like it does sound pretty believable i'm pretty sure that happens at some like high rate down there so i felt good about that but that yeah the watch that was like a low-key also a really cool experience that's the most expensive thing i think i've ever touched yeah. other than russell wilson's hand <laughs> <laughs> so, to, so talking of uh places you want to make your return visit to obviously we did talk uh last the end of october after the game over here how um, we lost it to the somewhere in the ether uh but what, what was your london experience like mike obviously we we, we spent some time on the Wednesday, Thursday night. Adam showed you around a little bit as well. Maybe we met up after the game on the Sunday night with some of your crew as well. What was your London experience like six months further on? Man, that was London was amazing. Man, my first time out of the country. Well, I went to Toronto, but my first time like really, really, really out of the the country that required like getting on a you know a plane because um, I drove I drove from Detroit to go to Toronto. So like that was. That was amazing, man. Both of you guys just like showed us the greatest time ever, man. We we still talk about going to that first restaurant where they they did everything possible to the pig, like, yeah. in terms of, like serving it to you. I, I'm pretty sure it's like pig brain. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's like pig blood. Pig blood. Pig, pig uh, blood. Uh, uh, Kev talked. Kev, my roommate who was out there with me, man. He just we talk about that all the time, hanging out, <laughs> drinking with Big Walt, uh, Walter Jones. That is like just. Just all the stuff we saw, you know, where they made that that Beatles cover, uh, going to see the, I think there's the Beatles, um, mm-hmm. going to see just everything, just going to where the Queen lives and all the guys out there with guns and just, it was just like, ah, oh, this is, this is beautiful. It's everything in all the pictures. Like, this is dope. Like, eating the food, just, yeah, I didn't eat it. I don't eat pork. So I was very hungry at that restaurant for a very long time <laughs> uh, until they, until they brought out. An entire fish, entire, entire fish, head and everything. I got a picture of it still. <laughs> Dude probably had a name still. It was just a whole entire fish, uh, and I ate the whole thing. It was just, it was great. The experience that, that you guys gave us, uh, just showing us around. Tips about getting a little card to help me, you know, write on the um, the oyster card. Yeah, the oyster, which I still have my oyster card by the way in my wallet. Never runs out. Uh, never expires. Yeah, that was. That was super, super clutch. I mean, the, the transportation there is better than any city I've ever been to. Uh, that was super easy to get around. Yeah, you know, the food, hanging out, going to see sites. Like, it was everything it was supposed to be. That game also kind of sucked. But, like, everything around the game, that was just perfect. It was absolutely beautiful. Took a bunch of good pictures. Got a bunch of memories I'll never forget, uh, especially the pig blood. That was pig blood, man. Pig blood and getting the whole fish on my plate. Because I just ordered fish, and I thought it was going to be fish and chips. Uh, like, I got every other bar I went to. And I was like, nope, here's an entire fish. His name is Charlie. Eat it. And I was like, all right, man. I've been sitting here watching all these guys eat pig for two hours. So I, I would have ate a dead squirrel if you would you know, gave me ranch at, at that point. So, yeah, that that experience that you guys contributed to, that was that was great. I, I definitely got to get back back to London. Yeah, man, well, you're more than welcome. If you ever do, there'll be, I'm sure there'll be a, a meet with several beers and vodka lime sodas waiting for you as well. Uh, 
Oh yeah. No oh, vodka. Yeah. No vodka. I was going to put Michael in the bin for this, but I can't do it now. He was. Oh yeah. No vodka. Like having having a go at vodka drinkers on yeah. Instagram, and I'm no Republican, so uh, I made it to change change my drink. <laughs> I just usually poke fun at my uh, my roommate, man, because every time we go out, you guys make Kev. Kev will drink whatever, but he really, really throws vodka back like it's oh, water. No. It is <laughs> insane. So it's just in our house. It's just nothing but beer. Cause I'm a beer guy. Drink a lot of beer. You know, there's a 12 pack of Rainier, and I think in our fridge right now, and like a half gallon of vodka. Right, like that's that's just the we're on different different ends there. I've actually transitioned now to where I don't really drink any hard liquor uh, anymore. I think I went to uh, I, I went to some like hookah bar like last week and just had like a cup of like Hennessy that this girl handed me, and it was just I was like, oh, okay, I took like two sips. I got to get out of here. This is not. <laughs> This is this is not this is not for me. Vodka's bad. I don't. I, I try not to shame people who who swear by it, but like the problem with vodka, even the expensive ones aren't good. You know, so like you get like something like Ciroc or Belvedere or Grey Goose. Those are all nasty. Even if like dark liquor, you go expensive, <laughs> it gets better. Like you buy a three hundred dollar cognac, that is going to be really good cognac. Tequila is very similar, but you could buy like a hundred dollar bottle of vodka, which I bought before take one sip like this is nasty yeah this is like rubbing alcohol i'm gonna cut my hand and use this like this is (laughs) yeah it's all it's all rubbing alcohol and hand sanitizer like i don't want to drink that even if it's 100 bucks i i i I agree with whiskey the older it gets the better it gets as well yeah like dark liquor you age that and you man that's that's getting better vodka is just like nah man this is (laughs) killing my insides (laughs) also with with them then you you met the, the 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 Legend in the inverted commas that is Terry Peppard, and I'm sure had trouble understanding him. Here comes Adam joke about my accent, but I mean, what, what, well, did you have trouble with? And you had a, you had a couple of good, st- and you had a couple of good stories about um, our former president of the of the group as well, which were quite touching that we didn't get a chance to to speak about because we lost the tapes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, my my story, yeah, that's a. Uh... Yeah, man, I forgot. I'm not, not I didn't forget about it. Yeah, how could I not mention the story? Yeah, like that was really fun. Got great feedback um, because it was like people don't really understand like how the Seahawks of all teams could be so big internationally. Like that's really like crazy. And like hanging out with you guys and, and all the people you guys introduced me to really helped bring it to life. Yeah, my man was really hard to understand. But <laughs> I, I got him in there. I think I even direct quoted him, like, at yeah, you, did. too. Yeah. So uh, that was really, really hard. Because where we were talking was loud, too. It was a, a yeah. pub somewhere. It was very loud. So that was that was tough. But, yeah, that was that that came out really well. At the party you guys threw uh, after was just beautiful. My friends still talk about that, too. You know, mostly oh, yeah, because everyone, Saturday. yeah, everyone, Saturday. everyone thought I was one of the Griffin brothers, so that's really why they talk about it. <laughs> uh, but like that that party where we bought the Tyler hoodies, uh, just I'm still I'm wearing my Helsinki Hope bracelet right now. I wear it every day. Um, like that that party was a, amazing. Everyone thought my friends were famous, thought they were athletes. Uh, <laughs> it was dope. We had like a little roped off section on like the second floor. We were yeah. like. Right next to Steve Rabel and his people, it's like this is great. I'm signing autographs and taking pictures all all night. They had no idea why until some lady came up and was like, "Hey man, I had to tell a bunch of people you're not you're not Shaq Griffin." I was like, "Oh damn, that's what's going on." I had no idea, I had no clue, and it's and that still happens by the way. Even that's not even an international thing. That's everywhere. It happened in Detroit. I broke some little kid's heart. It's like, "Hey, I used to kill Griffin." I was like, "Nope." He's like, "Ah, oh, damn." And just broke broke his heart. A staffer, a Seahawks staffer. I don't even know who he is. Uh, black dude had glasses on and a visor. Walked by me at OTAs. He's like, dude, you have no idea how many people you think you're Shaq. Just shook his head and walked. We weren't even having a conversation. He just walked by and like mumbled it and kept going. <laughs> I was like, that's that's weird. It's like Shaq's on the team. He's actually out there in a jersey. <laughs> like, why would anyone think he's right here with a notepad? That makes makes no sense. But yeah, that that party you guys threw absolutely fabulous and that was that was the the highlight probably besides the pig the pig night the pig night was legendary because that was the first night the end night with the with the party that was that was special and also also you showed you told you passed on the uh, one of the terry stories which involved the seahawks general manager as well didn't you yes that was oh did i mention i tried to get john snyder to confirm that 
Uh, but the Seahawks kind of just like stiff armed me, like almost literally in the locker room after they won the game. I pulled up the picture. I can't remember which one of you guys sent me the picture from the Space yeah. Needle. Uh, I was like, "Do you remember this?" Oh no, he 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 didn't remember. But then uh, I told him because that man has he's passed since, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And I told him he was like, "Oh, send my send my condolences." Because I think he thought that like it just happened. Yeah. Because uh, it was right after the win. There's a bunch of rap music playing, and you're not supposed to talk to the general manager after games. So after the convo was like, like ten seconds, but I did try. Uh, but I thought that that was like really really cool to get to get that in there. I'm glad we had a visual uh, for that too, man. That story turned out really really well. You never really know when you're talking to a bunch of strangers like how the stories are gonna turn out, but you get a couple good characters in there, a couple good stories, give people a bunch of beers and get them talking. And it turns out great. Yeah, uh, Adam. No, I think I think we're good. I, I'm still quite surprised we didn't get thrown out of that pig blood restaurant given the. Uh, and then that was that was Walter Jones led screaming <laughs> go hawks every time a toast was going up. Oh uh, wow! That's, that's, yeah, that's the that last was, time. I, and, that's and, that's oh. the last time I make a recommendation to one of my friends' restaurants for a group of twelve Seahawk fans. <laughs> oh, that was yeah. That was we were there for so long, just so much drinking. Jesus. And there's, and there's also the after the Sunday night with Walt in Walt's hotel bar, where she paid for every round known to man, didn't he? Yeah, I'm, Kevin was happy about that. <laughs> I mean, I was happy for him, but I was because. I mean, you, yeah, it made sense later when you guys explained it. Like, yeah, you want to ask Walt to pay the first, like, meet, first time meeting him, which makes sense. Like, our first time having him out there, like, hey, man, pick up the tab. Yeah. I understood that after the fact. But in the moment, I'm thinking, <laughs> this is like 1,200 pounds. <laughs> we could all chip in, which we did, but, like, Walt's got it. <laughs> he's, he's got it all. He's good. He could just, because he was, not only is he paid, he was paid to be there. Yeah, like in no, London, true. so like he, he he probably could have used whatever like per diem he was given to to knock that out. Wouldn't even have to charge his regular card. But I mean, I don't want to be all up in the man's pockets. But I mean, <laughs> come on, you know, it's Walter Jones. So yeah, when Kevin got back after the game, when uh, it was like, yeah, man, we were with, we were Derek McFadden and Walter Jones at this five star hotel, expensive shots. He was like, yeah, man, Walt dropped his wallet on the table, picked it up. I was like, what? <laughs> oh man and i missed out on that i was like good good for you guys man because that because when he was just i don't know what hotel you guys were at but he said it was nice it was, it was, was, there was a particularly yeah the landmarks a particularly good hotel it was it, it was it was like walking into the, the titanic it was insane yeah that was cool. yeah, I, I wish i at least got one drink on <laughs> that's that's my new goal now like there, he, I, I gotta get a beer or something on walt's tab at there's, 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 there's there's always october because there is a, a karaoke contest in the offing with walt and myself so if if we hook up in october when i'm over then i'm, I'm sure that opportunity may arise mike oh yeah i mean oh i can't wait till you guys uh, uh come out here man october for this game definitely Definitely yeah. need, need need that experience. Get no vodka though, at least not for me. Kev, <laughs> Kev, Kev will sp- try to supply it. I will. I'll, I'll get anything else: champagne, wine, beer, whiskey, whatever. Cool. Uh, quick spin in the bin, Adam. Yeah, let's do it. First of all, this is an exciting time uh, for our organization. 2017 Browns joined the 2008 Lions as the only teams to go 0-16. Get in the bin. Give me Josh Freeman, who was the 17th pick in the first round, over Cam Newton, who was the number one overall pick. And the 2015 AP Most Valuable Player is Cam Newton. Get in the bin. Chip Kelly's an evolver, and he's a smart guy, and I think he's going to go to San Francisco and and Mike, and they're going to be a much more viable football franchise. That the 49ers are expected to clean house and dismiss head coach Chip Kelly. Get in the bin. Yeah, just to finish up this week's spin in the bin, I don't really think I've got one off the top of my head. Adam, I think you're prepared for it. Well, it was going to be Mike, but now we've, we've crossed that bridge. So uh, I've got another one. I am already very bored of the NFL quarterback tier tweets. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, there is nothing I could care about less than whether you think Aaron Rodgers is elite or nearly elite. And, and like where you put Matt Ryan or Deshaun Watson, like, it's already a tired, tired bit. And there, may, there was one which was quite good that I saw that you liked, Mike, with the useful and not useful. 
and that's all I really care about. But just enough now. I did see one that did a tier of tears of quarterbacks, and that was very good. But that, that, that's about it. The rest, yeah, it was like that, it was like tear inception or something like that. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. That that one was that one was cool. Yeah, I think Ben's. Uh, uh, who I think Arif. Ben Baldwin uh, did a good one. Arif, Arif, yeah. Arif had the the useful, not useful, which was good. I think Ben's also had the categories were something like um, our set. This these group like their team is set at QB, yeah. and that's probably even better because yeah. that's really all that matters. Like, all right, here's yeah. our quarterback. Are we good or no? It's very like simple. I don't know how. Uh, I think I can't remember. Someone was in there that should. Oh, Deshaun Watson was not in that group of their team is set at QB. I thought that was wrong. I think the Texans should feel like they're set. I feel like they shouldn't yeah. have to think they're drafting a QB. I think this time next year he'll be in the elite category personally, but that's just my prediction. Uh, yeah, I mean, him and that first year, he and Deshaun, or not Deshaun, uh, DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller, that th- mm-hmm. trio, they lit the league on fire. They lit the Seahawks up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Torched them. Yeah. Torched the Legion of Boom in Seattle. Torched them. Rookies. Well, not D-Hop, but yeah, rookies. Torched them. Like, no, Deshaun, Deshaun, the, the Texans are set. That's the only one I disagree with on Benz. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, but this, it is just amazing how quickly things get old. And I, I do agree that the kind of like, so, so after about six hours, like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Like, there's, you can hear all sorts and people are trying that. Uh, Mike, anyone for your bin this week? Ooh, this is, oh man, I think I just had something. I think it was like a. It's got to be Game of Thrones related or something. Actually, I don't, I don't, I'm not invested in Game of Thrones. Although I did spend two weeks watching the show, <laughs> I'm not invested in the years. So, people who are invested watch years and years of it, and yeah. I don't. Yeah. So. so- that uh, New York Times article that someone was praised for watching it in, was it five weeks? Yeah, that took that dude or woman. I didn't even read the article. It was like five weeks or something like that. And I was just like, ah, oh, rookie, I <laughs> knocked it out in like 10 days. <laughs> I really think I knocked out a whole eight seasons. In, and I, I didn't, obviously, all the episodes of season eight weren't out yet. But, I mean, I was like three or four in. So that was like another 80 minutes an episode. Yeah, I knocked it out in like. You know, ten ten days. I should, I'm glad Steve didn't have me write something about it because I would have <laughs> had to been. I would have then had to be very critical of the show. Uh, but then I learned everyone's really critical of the show, <laughs> especially right now. Everyone hates everything. Oh, yeah. It's a very I've, boring world we yeah, live in at the yeah. minute. Everyone just hates everything. I've I've never watched a second of it. So your tweets were enlightening. Uh, what what one of our friends were wanted us to ask wanted us to ask you who your favorite character was. Ooh, that's a good. That's a good question. I think I think I'm just go with Jon Snow. Uh, I only said Steve haven't watched the end of it. John Jon Snow is like the 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 lovable, admirable guy in the the show. I mean, there's a lot of descriptions for him, but like he had the best story in the whole show. Contrary to the little short dude's beliefs, uh, <laughs> the John Jon Snow had the best best story. I mean, it's not dude came back from the dead. I mean, I don't know how you yes. beat that. <laughs> His homie stabbed him in the heart like six times. He just woke up like two episodes later. I'm like, wait a minute, this dude is this, dude, this is a second coming. This is great. It's like this is he definitely had the best story, and it helped that his dad he his dad tried to be a version of that. Ned Stark tried to be a version of that like admirable dude who does things that are hard, but he does them out of out of love for lead, leading his people. He tried to do that, but he was an idiot. John was also an idiot, but he was less of an idiot than his dad. And it drove the show uh, really, really well. There's also a character on there named Sam Tarley, I think is his last name. Really, really lovable like character as well. He's like the Luke Wilson of Game of Thrones. Like, dude, just <laughs> he was just so so perfect. Was he was like really funny. Like he fall in love with like his his story and like just every move he makes. And every time it looks like he's gonna die, you're like, I, if they if they kill Sam, I'm out. Uh, and he spoiler he lives. So uh, those those are probably two two of my favorites. I also didn't mind King Joffrey. I I really I didn't. I thought I thought his character had a lot of value, even though he was an idiot. Uh, that fit right in because that show is full of idiots. Uh, yeah, the, the last forty five seconds of completely global. So anyone for the Ben Mike or is it just that New York Times? Up? Um, no, I think I want to. Can I get Adam Gase in there? He, yeah, yeah. Yes, any it, time. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with – I mean, you can throw anyone from the Jets. 
mm. in there. Oh, you know what? No, no, no. Can I or can I double up or can I switch? You can do, do, do whatever. Double, triple, quadruple, your show. I, I want to like collectively put all athletes who are against analytics in 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 the bin. Like mm-hmm. a, athletes who like refer to it as just like uh, nerds or like uh, it's useless or like stop listening to analytics. That's just so dumb. Not not because analytics are useful, because they are. That's part of it. It's like you play for, or you work for an organization who is using analytics. Doesn't matter what sport, they're all using analytics now. Everything is every team is using analytics. They either have an analytics department, they like freelance analytics people. They're using it for everything. They're using it for your medicine. They're using it for your conditioning and training and working out. They're using it in games, after games, during practice. It's analytics are not stupid. And the player rebellion against analytics is very dumb. It's led by people like Charles Barkley. Even LeBron just, you know, just tried to just throw shade at analytics. I think Metal World Peace today, Ron Artest, tweeting about Kobe's greatness, said stats are for people who can't play and just want to justify their theories or something like that. I was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. No, man. <laughs> stats are useful. Inf- stats are information. You use information to make uh, uh, wise decisions. So, yeah, I want every player – and at baseball, football, basketball, who's like against nerds and analytics and advanced statistics because they love mid-range jumpers and running the ball. All those, everyone in the bin. That's just the dumbest thing ever. Love it. Love it. I'm all for that. Uh, yeah. So well, before we finish, just a quick note. We're going to try and get him on and ch- t- chat to him. But um, one of our UK seal, because I, uh, I sent, I told you about this, Mike, and you, you said you. Never heard of the place before. I text you, uh, Dan Ellis, who, who's one of our Welsh uh, contingent, uh, last week or so, 10 days ago, completed a hike or Machu Picchu and probably hammering that uh, pronunciation, which is pretty damn cool. He did from uh, Marie Curie and raised, I think, over 3,000, if not uh, over 4,000 pounds for that uh, pretty cool charity. So massive kudos to him. And also, Adam, he's a Spurs fan. As all the best people are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're, we're obviously you've been on a podcast a few times now. Mike, where can people catch you on social media and obviously all the athletic stuff as well? And your podcast. Uh, your podcast, yeah. Uh, let's see. First, Twitter, because that's the best way to get everything that I do, at Mike Dugar, M-I-K-E-D-U-G-A-R. My podcast, Seahawks Man to Man podcast, is always at the top of my page. Uh, all my stuff to the uh, on the athletic. Everything I write is just in my bio. So really, if you go to my Twitter, you get everything. It's like a one stop shop. My Twitter is like like my better. It's more useful than like my LinkedIn or something. I don't even know how to use that. Uh, so you want to get a hold of everything I do at Mike Dugar on Twitter. That's where you find the stories, podcasts, uh, tweet by Russell Wilson's voice. It's all there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I can speak for myself, I'm pretty certain I can speak for Adam, uh, Mike, yourself, uh, Jenks, and Ben Baldwin, and Steve, Stephen Cohen as well. I, it's a pretty, uh, like we were with Legion of the Boom, we are pretty fortunate to. Um, it's a stack have, roster. Have, uh, yeah, it's a stack roster. We are pretty fortunate to be able to get your writing skills and just that's the 30 seconds of blowing smoke up your ass, Mike. Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely liked it. Uh, we've. At the athletic, not as much as Seattle, but we're getting there. Like when you get to be able to like, obviously we're authoritative voice on the Seahawks, but like Jenks just wrote like the the ultimate Doug Baldwin piece. Yeah. Like we we have the the freedom to do that. I'm trying to do something like that with Russell, but like he wrote like, if you want to know about Doug Baldwin, you read that. Yeah. You start you start there. And you can read other stuff after, but you start there. And I think. We've got some really good writers who've done that type of work. You know, I, I think like our most popular example is Marcus Thompson in the Bay writing about the Warriors. Like, if you want to know about Kevin Durant or Steph Curry, Draymond, you read Marcus. Read whatever he's written about them, and you start there, and you go you you, know, you go on after that. So, you know, Jenks has written a few pieces like that. Like, I think he did one when Earl, uh, either during Earl's holdout or something like that. Uh, like once you start there, because he captures those guys really well, you know, that's you can almost stop after that. But you definitely got to start, you know, there when you want to know about some of your favorite athletes. And I think that's probably that's why we're going to be around because we have that power and we got people who are really good at it. 
Yeah, it, it's it's well worth the monthly or yearly or annual subscription and properly, properly to recommend people. If you haven't already, to sign up and read them. Uh, yeah, bask in what they are able to uh, deliver. Uh, Adam, anything else? Is that your fill for the this week? That's my fill. I'm now just terrified this podcast also hasn't recorded, but I think we're good. Yeah. So uh, Mike will definitely never speak to us again if this <laughs> doesn't work. So uh, here's hoping we can't do London. We can't do London stories again. So uh, <laughs> this, this one has to work. But uh, no, thanks as always, Bud, for joining us, and yeah. uh, I'm sure there'll be another time uh, in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, what, Mike, one more thing before we go. Uh, where, 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 where are you ranking Ventura in the Anderson Park album chronology? I, I hate stealing other people's opinions, but I think uh, I think Bob Monty Jones did a really like a really good like summary. Whereas like Ventura is a better album than something like Oxnard, but like Oxnard does have like better like singular songs on it. Like the the best songs on Oxnard, even if they don't all work together really well, I think they do. But if they don't work as well as on Ventura. They're they're better than just like individual. You got to listen to Ventura like start to finish. Yeah. You know you start with you start with the joint with Andre 3K and you end with the joint with Nate Dogg and you're like wow that was an experience where you can just kind of pop into Oxnard, play Trippy and then just move on. You know like standalone Trippy is great. I think Kendrick Lamar had that problem in his early, his career where you were better off listening to his whole thing as opposed to picking out two or three songs that were dope. So I think I think I'd have to go Malibu. I think I still would go probably go Malibu, Oxnard, Ventura. Yeah. Because like in terms of like what's a good, my favorite Anderson Pack songs are from the first two, and then like Come Home is in there somewhere with along with Make It Better with Smokey Robinson. Those are, it's all jamming though. Like Anderson, it's weird. Like I'm a big Anderson Pack guy right now, and still on Future, Future and Anderson <laughs> Pack, two guys who couldn't be any more different. Uh, it turns out making me is you got this drug dealing rapper from Atlanta, and you got this like warm drummer guy from that likes beaches in like Malibu. To I, I love them both. When they're gonna make a song together, I'm gonna lose my mind. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, Mike. Mike, your recommendations completely altered probably forever my uh, Spotify algorithm for the weekly playlist just because I've just just played Ventura and Malibu especially on repeat for like the last six, seven months. Oh yeah, those are beautiful. Anderson Pack's good, man. His music yeah. makes you feel good and yeah. that's like his, one of the first things you should want to do. His, uh, his, his tiny death session, my, my sister my sister hates that kind of music but she sat down and watched his uh, NPR tiny death where he just played drums he goes, that's really impressive, he can play it that quietly. So I think she, even she's on board with with his music. Uh, yeah, so if you want to get in touch with the podcast you can, all the usual means, the British podcast us on Podbean on Facebook, uh, UK Seattle Seahawks fans on Facebook, at Seahawks UK on uh, Twitter. Until next time, I'll see Adam. Enjoy Madrid and COYS, yes? Very much so. Up the Spurs. Yeah, uh, until next time, this has been the Pedestrian Podcast, and happy birthday, happy birthday, Tyler Helensky. And go Hawks. So I got to ask you, apart from the score, is there any one number that you look at right after a game that you use to either evaluate your performance or the team's performance? What are the most important numbers you look at when you look at the stat sheets after a game? Uh, so individually, I'll start there first. I look as a receiver, I look at my targets to catch ratio. So, you know, we'll go through the course of a game and the quarterback may th- throw me four or five passes I want to make sure that I'm catching four or five of those of those targets Um, and so that for me just because in Seattle we don't throw the ball that often we never have unfortunately Um, so I haven't been really able to compare myself to the greater collective of receivers in the NFL uh, just by gaudy numbers I haven't been able to do that so the way that I can compare myself to other individual receivers is by how many times the ball's thrown to him, how many times they catch it. And to me, if you're a receiver and the quarterback throws you the ball and you catch it more times than the other people do, then you might be a good receiver. So, um, and, you know, not to boost my own ego, but I'm, nobody's come close. So. That's, <laughs> you know.